Well, thank you everybody for uh, joining this joining us this evening uh, for the uh, webinar uh, with Sarah Resitic Haviland. Um, she is the author of James and Esther Cooper Jackson: Love and Courage in the Black Freedom Movement, as well as a uh, contributor to one of the chapters in Red Activist and Black Freedom. James and Esther Cooper Jackson and the Long Civil Rights Revolution. Uh, Sarah is also the Assistant Professor of History at St. Francis College and has contributed uh, many articles and, and other material to books on civil rights and the black freedom movement. Um, and we're really glad to have her here tonight to discuss with us the lives of James and Esther Cooper Jackson. Um, and without any further ado, we want to go ahead and jump right into the discussion. And uh, I'm going to start things off with a couple of questions for Sarah, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, so, welcome, Sarah. Hi, thank you. Uh, so, the first question this evening is uh, James and Esther Cooper Jackson shared a fascinating life. Uh, what first brought the lives of the Jacksons to your attention, and how did you decide to write a uh, joint uh, biography, which I think is pretty unique? All right, thank you. Um, well, uh, I actually started this project when I was an undergraduate in college. Um, I had taken a course where we looked at some iteration somewhere or another, and I can't quite put my finger on it at this point, of black internationalism in the pre-World War II and World War II years. And I got really interested in that idea because I had been studying um, African American history and African history, and I wasn't quite sure where to take it. Um, so I decided that for my senior thesis, I wanted to do something related to black uh, internationalism. Somebody along the way suggested that I should do oral histories and see if I could locate anyone who was still around at that point um, to interview and get some feedback from. And so I sent a bunch of emails to people who had worked on the period. and. Uh, Fortunately, somebody just gave me Esther Jackson's contact information. So I reached out to her and talked to her, wrote my thesis, ended up doing it just on the Southern Negro Youth Congress. And uh, when I went to graduate school about a year or so later, um, I reached out to them again to see if they would be willing to continue working with me and um, to get more input on some of the work I was interested in. Um, and at that point, this is around 2004, I visited them again. And um, Esther had, she just told me that they had a room full of paper um, that they were really, they wanted to have somebody help them with, but they weren't quite sure how to do it or where to go with it. Um, and I volunteered just to help them sort of work through some of the material before it went to an archive. Uh, so I spent about a year a year um, going there three to four times a week um, and just sorting through what was probably 200 boxes of paper. Um, a lot of it was just stuff that could be thrown away, but there was a ton of valuable material, valuable material in there as well that um, needed to go to an archive. Um, so I spent about a year doing that, and um, at that point I recognized that there was enough stuff that had been unexplored to that point by any sort of scholars who that needed to just have something written about it, and um, I decided to do a dissertation that was somehow going to be a joint biography of the two of them. Um, in terms of situating it in the historiography and thinking about why it mattered to do this particular project. I struggled for a little while. Um, and then one at one point, as I was going through these boxes, I found um, there was a box of World War II letters. So for people who have seen the book, um, 
the second chapter of it is devoted almost entirely to their World War II correspondence. Um, and what I found when I was looking through the correspondence was this just amazing interaction of love and activism, this idea that their family life and that their marriage was deeply entwined with how they saw themselves as activists and how they saw themselves as people who were going to make a contribution to some sort of greater good. Um, and so at that point, when I was reading through the war letters and I was looking at what they were saying to each other, I realized that the way to conceptualize their lives was to see how over the course of, I think the book covers, um, you know, I go from about their upbringings in the 1920s to about the 1980s when they both enter retirement, um, what I thought needed to happen was that I would look at how their personal lives intertwined with the changing black freedom movement alongside the political challenges of the Cold War, of the uh, World War II, of the civil rights era and sort of trace that to see what I could sort of make of it that was new. So in a lot of ways it seems like it was this merger of their uh, life as activists and organizers as well as their uh, deep commitment to each other uh, throughout throughout all of these historic events. Am I, am I reading you right? Absolutely. Um, that was one of the things that I saw come through very clearly in the war letters. Um, there is one exchange that actually opens the second chapter where uh, James Jackson, I refer to him as Jack in the book because that's what his friends and family called him, he was just going, he was writing this very extensive letter that went on for pages and pages about um, the you know, Communist Party policy and about the relationship between um, communists and other activists and on and on. And then at one point he said, you know, politics, 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 you know, the other girls get all this love poetry and what am I, some kind of dope that I'm just sending you these letters all about politics. And she wrote back, um, this is one of the really great things about these war letters is that he actually collected and sent her letters back to her so that they would have this kind of record. Um, and she wrote back and she said, please don't stop talking to me about politics because I would rather discuss all of this with you than with anybody else. And so it was at that moment when I was looking through these letters that I saw that as this, their politics were so important to their marriage and that their marriage was so important to the way that they saw themselves moving forward in political activism. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned a little bit earlier the uh, Southern Negro Youth Congress. Uh, do you mind ex exploring that a little bit more and James and Esther's role in, in the Southern Negro Youth Congress as well as its relationship to the National Negro Congress um, as well as some of the uh, challenges that James and Esther faced uh, in the South? Um, while they were organizing for the Southern Negro Youth Congress? Yeah, um, so James Jackson was a founding member of the SNYC um, in 1937, and part of that came out of his own upbringing. He was a Boy Scout. Um, he became, he, was, he organized the first black Boy Scout troop in Virginia um, when he was just a young kid, about 12 or so. And um, at that point in his life, he realized um, he had an encounter with an older couple on a bus. He was in his Boy Scout uniform, and he thought that would shield him from the experience of racism. But the couple um, engaged in this almost assault on him. And um, at that point, he started to see his politics crystallize a bit. His father was also very active in Richmond and um, had been a, a leader in the Richmond community, both as a pharmacist and as somebody who fought back against the restrictions of segregation in that city. And um, as he grew older, he encountered, uh, he basically 
fought back against racism by shielding himself with hatred, and that happened, and that kind of continued on until he went to college. In his freshman year of college in, at Virginia Union University at the age of 16, um, he was elected by his classmates to attend a youth organizing conference. Um, and when he went to that conference, he met the first white people who didn't treat him as though he was inferior. Um, and they were communists. So when he was 16, he spent his entire summer um, studying communist ideology and reading Marx and so on uh, and joined the Communist Party. Uh, so he continued on at Virginia Union and went to graduate school at um, Howard, followed in his father's footsteps and went to pharmacy school there, and had every intention of um, taking over his father's pharmacy. But upon uh, becoming more activist in his orientation, he also engaged in some youth organizing, both uh, with, within Virginia Union University and in other settings as well. Um, and he attended the first meeting of the National Negro Congress, which I believe was in Chicago in 1935 or 36. And um, when he was there, he and a few other organizers, a few other young men who were from the South, they basically decided that the youth of the South had a particular set of needs and a particular orientation um, that they needed to pursue differently than what the National Negro Congress was doing. So um, they decided that they were going to have um, an all-Southern Negro Youth Conference, which ended up happening in 1937 in Richmond, Virginia, where uh, Jack grew up. So when he was um, organizing this, one of the things that kind of comes out of it in this initial period of the Southern Negro Youth Congress was that he ultimately um, leads the organization in Richmond in, the, in 1937, 1938, um, and they end up organizing the tobacco workers in Richmond and um, helping them to form a union that fights back against the industry. Um, and one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about that is that when Jack, Jack was a young boy, he used to sit outside of his father's pharmacy and watch these predominantly black women um, walk by every evening as they were going home from the tobacco factories, and he would say hello to them every night. So as he's entering adulthood, one of the things that he does is to help these women that had been a part of his experience growing up um, to sort of make better working conditions for themselves. The SNYC moved to Birmingham in the late 1930s and set up their organizational headquarters there. At the time, Esther had been a graduate student at Fisk University in sociology. Um, she was working in a settlement house in Nashville when Jack, who took a leave of absence from the Southern Negro Youth Congress, uh, to work on Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma, uh, he ended up going through Nashville to do some research. And they met there, um, and that's where she learned about the Southern Negro Youth Congress. She decided to spend a summer organizing in Birmingham and working with the organization. And then um, at that point, her relationship with him had gotten so much more involved, and she had sort of developed this commitment to the organization as well, that when choosing between pursuing a PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago or continuing to organize in Birmingham, she chose Birmingham. Um, the SNYC, I would say, offers some really interesting precursors to civil rights. They're doing things like bus integration protests, voting rights activism, a lot of the things that get mirrored and uh, sort of replicated in the 60s. Um, but it's happening during the context of World War II in the immediate post-war years. Um, and the organization itself suffer, suffers as the Cold War mounts in the post-World War II years and ultimately ends up meeting its demise by 1949 in the face of massive um, anti-communist backlash. <laughs>
But before we jump into the uh, kind of post-war period and the uh, uh, you know co anti-communist backlash, do you mind speaking a little bit more about how James and Esther kind of weathered uh, numerous prolonged periods of separation and how that impacted their relationship to each other and their politics? If I'm not mistaken, uh, you know James uh, was away. Uh, at war, fighting fascism for a number of years, and then also uh, was separated from Esther quite a bit during the McCarthy witch hunts. And so, you know, how how did their relationship manage that, and how did they also navigate the raising of children uh, and sharing familial responsibilities under the context of uh, this this struggle, this war, this struggle that was taking place uh, to to you know expand rights for African Americans while trying to protect uh, the existence of the Communist Party? So a great question. Um, so they got married in 1941 and um, almost immediately upon getting married uh, Jack left to do some sort of uh, research and organizing trip so it almost set the pattern for their early marriage in a lot of ways. Um, he served in the army from 1943 to 1945, um, and during those years, so Harriet was born uh, right before he left to serve um, in the armed forces. He was in the China Burma India theater of World War II, um, and I think that ends up being, in a lot of ways, a real trial period for them, and a way to figure out how they're going to navigate, even though they have no idea what's coming down the road for them. Um, it serves as this foundation for them to navigate a lot of the, the struggles that they're going to face going forward. They wrote letters to each other every day um, during World War II, and they established this idea for themselves um, of what their life was going to be like in the post-war years, and they used their correspondence as a way to do that. Um, and so, in a lot of ways, because they obviously have no idea that they're going to face another nearly five-year period of separation once Jack Smith Act indictment comes down in 1951, um, they're really just preparing for a post-war life together, which they have for a very brief period. When he returns, um, in an interesting sort of turn on stereotypes, he ends up meeting her in New York City. She went to represent the Southern Negro Youth Congress um, in England and then in Stalingrad uh, as a member of the World Youth Cong Congress um, in 1945. So he got back to the United States before she did, and he met her on a dock in New York City. Uh, they had their reunion that way, um, and for a few years he was kind of working in New Orleans as a Communist Party leader, and then they decided to move to Detroit, and they both worked there. They had a second child, um, and were both involved in organizing. They were attempting to kind of build on the foundations of the radical marriage that they had attempted to establish. Uh, both before he left for war and it, through their correspondence, the um, ideals about gender that they had, and so on. Um, and as the anti-communist tension of the early Cold War starts to mount, they decided that it would be beneficial to move to New York City and uh, attempt to be active there. Once they move, um, in 1951, Jack was indicted under the Smith Act in that round of second string indictments. Um, and when he got indicted, he was among the people who went underground. So he disappeared for uh, about almost five years and um, was just completely missing. So the foundations that they had laid during the World War II years where they were able to correspond with each other every day and talk about their plans for when they were reunited um, that kind of disappeared in the 1950s, but at that point they had laid such a solid foundation um, at basing their marriage on both the ideals of gender egalitarianism, their love for one another, um, and their commitment to their politics that she um, basically weathers this storm 
uh, raising her daughters in Brooklyn as the FBI is hounding them um, and following them around everywhere, um, that by the time he comes back, um, they're ready to reunite. That doesn't mean that it's uncomplicated or not difficult um, as they reunited in 19, late 1955 into 1956 and 1957. Um, they recognized that the trials of the McCarthy era and the trauma of that period had taken a huge toll on their marriage and it took a lot of work for them to put it back together and they had to recommit to one another in a lot of ways. Um, so one of the things that I try to do in the book is illustrate how um, in the 1950s there was this tremendous ideal of family um, and um, this notion of the nuclear family as a key component of American democracy and fighting the Cold War that um, Esther and Jack, did, number one, didn't experience because of their circumstances, but number two, that Esther ends up utilizing as a tool not only to um, promote the end of the harassment of Smith Act families, but also as a way to um, illustrate how McCarthyism ends up being on an assault on the Black Freedom Movement because it ends up taking key black leaders out of the loop. Um, and so they end up weathering these periods of separation by focusing on their activism, but also by um, seeing how their activism ends up committing them to one another. I have to say that uh, the detail to which you go and talk about their relationship during this, these numerous periods of tumultuous uh, events uh, is one of the one of the best parts about the book, and one of the things that I really appreciate um, is that it's not just a history of politics, but a history of their relationship to each other and how they weather, weather these events. And so uh, I just wanted to add that. But uh, uh, more, more generally, uh, what impact did the assault on communists like Jack and Esther, um, you know, due to the Smith Act and the McCarran Act, have on the larger civil rights movement and and also what what impact did it have on James and Esther's ability to participate in, in the emergent struggles of the time and the emergent movements of the time you know as you mentioned earlier uh, they you know they were hounded by the FBI uh, et cetera et cetera and so what 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 impact did that have on their ability to participate and to lend some of their uh, years of organizing experience to the emerging movements of the time? That's a great question. Um, I think one of the things in terms of the broader arc of the Black Freedom Movement, um, one of the ways that we can look at that is through how historians have treated um, the idea that there is, I think in the last 30 or so years, there's been increasing discussion among historians about um, how we sort of time the start of civil rights and how we um, understand the different iterations of black freedom that happen in US history over the course of the 20th century. Um, and I think one of the things that this period really tells us is that um, there is a distinct moment where the Cold War starts and McCarthyism sort of takes over the American mindset in a lot of ways. Um, and that puts a halt on a lot of the black radical organizing that had happened in the 1930s and 1940s during the Popular Front years. Um, and of course the Popular Front has its own complex history that goes through iterations in the 1930s, during the World War II period, and in the immediate post-war years. Um, but what McCarthyism end up, ends up doing in the, as it sort of emerges in the late 1940s and 1950s is um, it calls into question this idea that people who have a certain political framework that they're working with can be a part of any sort of activist struggle. I mean, I think if you take the fact that 
even the NAACP was labeled as a communist organization by some people at a certain point, um, that, that sort of sheds light on the larger context of what activism looked like in the late 1930s and 1940s. So that meant that for people who were actually committed to the ideals of communism, uh, like Esther and Jack in this period, that their activism was undermined and diminished in a lot of ways because it was affiliated with something that was outside the, the American political mainstream. So, for example, uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is that Esther, when they moved to Detroit in the late 1940s, um, she joined a couple of organizations, the Progressive Party, uh, and worked on the Henry Wallace campaign, um, as well as the Civil Rights Congress. She maintained her membership in the NAACP, um, and the FBI informants who were following her uh, noted that she was a member of all of these organizations, right? So it was the Progressive Party, the Civil Rights Congress, and the NAACP, um, and they didn't make any distinctions among the three. So one of the things that ends up happening is that the way black activism and the black freedom movement plays out in the late 1940s is that anything that's going on gets undermined by the broader political context. Um, and I think one of the things that you see over the course of the, 19, the early 1950s, particularly when Jack is underground and Esther is using this political context to make an argument for not just her husband's freedom, but for the broader freedom of political expression in the black freedom movement, um, is that it gets sort of sidelined in a lot of ways, and it gets kind of put under a different sort of activist umbrella in terms of how we understand um, the long black freedom movement. Um, by the time Jack emerges in late 1955, um, he, one of the things that the couple is able to do after they kind of put their marriage back together and figure out what their family life is going to look like moving forward, um, is that he tries to revitalize the communist presence in civil rights by um, using civil rights as a key issue as the editor of um, the worker um, in the 1960s. But he's largely unsuccessful in kind of tying the movements back together. Um, Esther moves forward from that period by um, she ends up sort of removing herself from the Communist Party in 1956 after the um, revelations of Stalin's crimes and after the trauma of the McCarthy period. And she ends up focusing on Freedom Ways magazine, which sort of allows her to uh, create new connections with other groups that are working on civil rights in different political contexts. So um, I think the Cold War, particularly the early Cold War, ends up having this dramatic effect on civil rights by shaping how particular activists participate in it. Um, and it does that by affecting how um, the politics people participate in shape their own personal experiences. Thank you. I, you know, I, we had uh, Gerald Horn on a week or two ago to talk about uh, William Patterson in the Civil Rights Congress, and it, it seems to me that not only did James and Esther uh, suffer throughout this time, but uh, Leaders like Patterson, um, Althea Hunton, Claudia Jones, um, other uh, well-known uh, African-American leaders, Ben Davis comes to mind. Um, not only did all of those individuals and the organizations that they worked with uh, suffered throughout this period, but because they were effectively, in some regards, removed from the broader movement, um, it also served to diminish, like you said, the uh, the uh, projections in the, in the direction of the broader civil rights movement. Am I understanding that right? Absolutely, yes. One, okay. Well, <laughs> so I'm going to ask maybe one more question, and then we, maybe we can open it up for broader uh, questions from the audience. Um, and the final question that I have here is, uh, you know, we, we usually hear a, a lot about the party uh, and its members during the uh, so-called heyday and into the post-war period and then, 
McCarthyism, and most histories uh, seem to stop at that point uh, as if the party and party members just magically disappeared from the political realm. Uh, do you mind uh, shedding some light on James and Esther's work uh, into the 70s and 80s? Um, sure. Um, I think, you know, for one of the things that happens after the McCarthy period, like I said, Esther steps back from um, sort of formal party organizing around 1956 when her husband reemerges. Um, and when he reemerges, I think one of the interesting things that happens, um, particularly like in relation to the relationship that they have, is that she um, almost feels like she had committed an enormous amount of time to an, an enormous amount of energy and emotion and psychological trauma to the party while her husband was underground. She endured tremendous harassment and so on. Um, and then to hear about the uh, atrocities in the Soviet Union and have them kind of verified, she felt like at that moment she needed to step back and remove herself. She never officially withdrew from the party, but she completely withdrew herself from formal party organizing in the late 1950s. But one of the things that happens with him is that uh, he had given up everything, his family, his you know, seeing his daughters, Harriet was, I think, four when he left. No, Harriet was, Harriet was a little older. Harriet was around eight when he left. Kathy was about three or four when he left. And he was gone for um, four and a half, five years. So he missed um, a significant portion of his daughter's childhoods um, in commitment to an ideal, and I think what happens in a way for him is that he recommits himself um, and really hones in on the idea that if he had given up so much for this, he has to make it work. Um, and what he ends up doing is kind of tying himself closer to the party. One of the things about their marriage that's really interesting is that they're both able to see themselves partially as a result of their periods of um, prolonged separation as having separate careers and having separate political ideologies that can work together but don't necessarily need to be pol like entirely politically aligned all the time. So in the 1960s, and I, um, he edits The Worker um, and attempts to make civil rights its key feature. Um, and after he resigns as editor of The Worker, he served in a number of capacities uh, for the Communist Party and attempted to continue to revitalize it. He did a lot of talks, um, but one of the things that happens with him is that he gets um, sort of more entwined in the ideological and theoretical standpoints and attempts to make them relevant. Um, for a broader political audience, which doesn't ultimately end up working very well for him, um, or for, I mean, the party ends up seeing occasional bumps in its um, membership numbers, but for the most part, it ends up declining in its influence over the 70s and particularly in the 80s. For Esther, uh, she began editing Freedom Ways magazine, which is a quarterly journal of the Black Freedom Movement, in 1960, she founded it with Shirley Graham Du Bois and a few other people. And um, what that magazine ends up doing is it gives the springboard to um, activists, writers, scholars, artists, and people with a whole range of political perspectives. Um, and it gives them this platform to talk about the things that are going on um, in a variety of ways. So um, while this effort was supported in a lot of ways by the Communist Party, I think they gave them funding um, and provided them with, an, um, with su some support, there was also um, some contentious, there were some contentious moments. There were instances where, for instance, um, party members, you know, accused Jack of um, you know, his wife is going off the script in some ways by supporting this magazine, which is promoting certain views that we don't necessarily agree with. 
Um, and he responded by kind of drawing on the foundations of their marriage and saying, like, if you want me to be a male chauvinist until my wife to stop, then that's, you know, that's not what we're about. Um, and she ends up providing, through Freedom Ways as a managing editor, um, a platform for prominent black artists, writers, um, scholars, and international intellectuals um, that may not have otherwise been there at the time that they were getting their careers off the ground. For example, um, Alice Walker, Nikki Giovanni, um, Audre Lorde, and others. Um, so the relationship between the party and these other organizations and movements at this point is a little more tenuous. Um, and I think you can see through Jack's participation that there's still some effort to bring them together, but it's maybe not as successful as it had been in earlier um, periods um, uh, in spite of their efforts to make it so. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I don't know if it's possible if uh, B or whoever uh, maybe wants to open up the floor to some questions from the audience and the remaining uh, 20 sub on minutes that we have. Okay, if you have a question or comment, please use your raised hand icon and I will open your mic. Okay. Roan, Frazier, you're self-muted. Okay, there you are. Yes. Hi, good evening. Thank you to the Communist Party for organizing this. I got the email from Royce Adams, um, and I appreciate Sarah's book. I had written my dissertation on um, black journalism and uh, mentioned, interviewed Esther Cooper Jackson in her home in Brooklyn in 2012. And um, Ms. Jackson mentioned Sarah's work, and I'm glad to see it. I bought the book in 2015. Congratulations, Sarah, on this very important book. Thank you. That I th think should really open some necessary conversations about the role of the left in the black freedom movement. Um, very important work. Um, to pr this, like you said, this is really a necessary conversation about how to maintain romantic uh, relations. So I have a comment and a question. So I'm, a begin I'm going to begin with my comment and then finish with a question. Um, so this is a very important book because it begins a conversation about romantic relationships within revolutionary struggle. And um, I'm writing a review of Sarah's very important book, and I'm going to begin and end with the necessity of the book for everybody to read. Um, those who focus on black power individuals and those who focus on civil rights individuals need to see the importance of Esther Cooper Jackson and James Jackson's role in the black freedom struggle. Um, I wrote, I took a lot of notes and I have a lot of questions, but as was mentioned earlier, we only have 20 minutes. Less than that. So my question um, that will stem from this comment is the way, Sarah, you use um, three terms interchangeably that I'd like you to just clarify. Um, the left, um, the black freedom movement, and you use another term that I'd like you to clarify, democracy. Um, for me, there is a difference between the left and the black freedom movement. In the book, you very often talk about how James and Esther Cooper Jackson's work is part of the black freedom movement. That is unmistakable. Their work is part of the black freedom movement. Um, what is, I think, potentially mistakable is their work being part of the left. Because as I was reading, I was hoping you would distinguish between what they were doing as Communist Party members and what the Democratic Party was doing. And I think Esther Cooper Jackson in her important must-read pamphlet, This Is My Husband, talks about how the Smith Act came from a Virginia U.S. Senator who was a Dixiecrat. Yeah. But, but arguably that could be part of the left, that could be part of the political system. So I just wanted to, my basic question is, could you clarify what you meant? And then democracy, you, 
you argue that they were for democracy. In my mind, that's a capitalist democracy. I, it seems like that's what you're edging toward, and that's not philosophically what they were for. So my question is, could you just clarify the black freedom movement, comma, the left, comma, and what you meant in the biography by democracy? Right, that's a great question. Um, I think when when I talk when I'm talking about the Black Freedom Movement, um, what I mean by that is the the long struggle um, among African Americans from uh, the start of formalized segregation, and you know even before that, um, through the um, through various periods of um, different kinds of political struggle. So I think, um, you know, what you see in the progressive era is different from the type of organizing against racism as a um, sort of political system and institution that you, then you see in the Harlem Renaissance, then you see in the Great Depression, that you see in the World War II and post-war years. Um, and I think the way that I'm the way that I'm using the Black Freedom Movement is a it's sort of an umbrella way to refer to all of these different iterations of what is most commonly known and commonly understood as the struggle for civil rights. Um, although I would argue that you could situate that more um, distinctly in the post-war years and particularly um, from the Brown versus Board of Education decision through the passage of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act in 64 and 65. Of course, the Black Freedom Movement continues beyond that point because those um, moments don't necessarily address all of the concerns and problems that exist. Um, so I follow that thread into uh, the post-civil um, rights legislation years, 60, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and I'm using that terminology as a way to talk about how there are lots of different periods, um, although the, the strategies in different moments are different based on the political contexts, um, the ultimate goal is the dismantling of the oppressive structures of Jim Crow, segregation, institutionalized racism, and so on. Uh, when I'm talking about the left, I am particularly referring to organizations that are situated um, at least a little bit, if not a lot, outside of the political mainstream. So. Um, when we're talking about the Democratic Party, of course, that's um, a political party that's in enormous flux in the period the book addresses. And while there are certain aspects of the ideals of democracy um, and the ideals of participation, the idea that everybody has a voice that apply in certain moments to the Democratic Party, um, the notion of the Democratic Party itself and the um, way that it configures itself in the political moments um, depends enormously on when you're talking about the Democratic Party in the 1940s when the Smith Act um, is enacted is a different Democratic Party than you see um, as it's in transition under Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. Um, and so I would separate the idea of the, um, the political left would be people who are situated in um, more progressive organizing um, than the political mainstream, particularly the Democratic Party or whatever is situated on that end of the political mainstream at that moment. Um, and when I'm talking about democracy, I would say that I'm mainly referring to um, not necessarily the parties or the way that it's lived on the ground in policy, but the ideals of um, democracy, that everybody has a voice in the government and everybody, um, the, the ideal that people who feel oppressed can speak out against their government um, and that um, there's an ability that you have to uh, sort of voice your concerns. Does that clarify? Yes, thank you, Sarah. That answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, if anybody else has a question, uh, use your raised hand icon and we will open your mic. Bill Meyer, your mic is open. Bill Meyer, your mic is open. Okay. If you have a question or comment, please use your raised hand icon and we will open your mic. If you have a question, Norma, your mic is open. Alright, I've sent you a question uh, in, in writing as it were. <laughs> uh, is our party enthusiastically encouraging people Oh, God, the computer makes up its own mind. Uh, people to read Grover Fur's reset research, such as Khrushchev lied and other uh, of his books, to get reasonably informed about the USSR and its undermining, undermining by internal forces. Uh, Fur has been researching in Russia uh, material that has only recently been released in the past nine years showing uh, that uh, the lies of Khrushchev were enough to uh, aid the downfall of the uh, uh, communist struggle by talk attributing to Stalin all manner of acts that he didn't do. Uh, and he goes on in other books, uh, you could look those up, but it's something I, I think is essential to our organization in order to preserve the character of communist struggle, the strength and value of communist struggle, and to take away the uh, idea that there is some way to say Hitler and Stalin, <laughs> that that's really preposterous and uh, that the uh, capitalists love it and uh, that we who know better really hate that and and work for greater knowledge about what actually was going on. Yeah, I'm 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 not familiar with that work, um, but but I would say that um, I you know having done the research for this particular book, um, you know, and having taught. U.S. history for the last 11 years to undergraduates um, who have very much changed over the last 11 years. Um, one of the things I do see is that there is in our culture a lot of baggage left over from the Cold War that I think has lingered um, from the McCarthy period and I don't necessarily think that our political mainstream or cultural mainstream has an objective or, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, but um, has, a, has a really solid lens for understanding and exploring this, yet without the political um, uh, sort of baggage that came with the Cold War. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how to necessarily answer your question, but I do think that it's important to um, to try and find for for our broader culture to find a way to um, think about these kinds of questions without necessarily linking it to the the deep baggage that our culture has about um, the Cold War um, and the idea of communism as just a broad concept that people don't necessarily understand. I don't know if that helps at all, but um, that's my experience. Joe, your mic is open. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, a question. I was struck by um, what you said with regard to uh, Jackson's attempt to resituate the party and its relationship to the broader African American freedom movement. And in that connection, um, in the 50s, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote an article in Paul Robeson's magazine. Um, it's called 100 Years of Negro Freedom. And in it, he critiques um, 
the self-determination for the black belt thesis Du Bois does, and he puts forward the concept of the uh, need to um, struggle for full equality, as he uh, puts it, um, singling out um, the, the role of uh, uh, black workers. Uh, did you, in the course of your um, uh, writing, uh, come across uh, I know that the Jacksons were very friendly with uh, Dr. Du Bois, um, and um, I was wondering if you could speak a, a, about that a little bit. And 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 did you see any evidence of a uh, of a conversation between uh, the Du Boises uh, and the Jacksons dealing with that particular question? Yeah, they were very much. Um you know, involved in each other's experiences, particularly in the late 1950s. Um, I think, actually, Jack had met uh, Du Bois as a child. Um, he was passing through Richmond and apparently had dinner at their house at one point. Um, and he was raised on uh, Du Bois and um, the, uh, the crisis and the different sorts of articles that were in there. Esther first met uh, Du Bois when she was in London for the World Youth Conference in 1945, um, and I guess she had just so impressed him with um, their encounter there that he um, agreed to give a keynote address at the 1946 Southern Negro Youth Conference in Columbia, South Carolina um, in, uh, in that year, and he there gave his famous Behold the Land speech where he argued that young black Southerners didn't need to go to the North, and they didn't need to um, flee for job opportunities, that they needed to um, embrace the South as their land and as, their, um, as the place where they existed and fight for equality and fight for opportunities there. And from that point onward, the, um, the couple maintained a relationship with him when Jack was underground, um, just in terms of party philosophy and um, policy, he and Henry Winston were writing articles under pseudonyms. Um, Jack's, for what it's worth, was uh, Charles P. Mann. He often signed off as C.P. Mann, which I think is just a reflection of his humor. Um, but they wrote plenty of articles together and individually about the party's relationship with the emerging civil rights movement, particularly in um, 1955, as things are really getting off the ground after Brown versus Board of Ed. Um, and one of the things that this ends up doing is it provides a catalyst in 1959 for the party to revise its position on the Negro question. Um, and Jack ends up being one of the key authors of the revision of the position on the Negro question and the move away from the Black Belt thesis. Um, it's also, I think, worth noting that Du Bois um, testified at Jack's defense in Jack's defense at his Smith Act trial, um, and he made a very strong stand in that setting. Um, about the relationship between a person's political ideals and their um, sort of broader um, personality and significance as an individual in a movement. And um, in fact, Du Bois, after he moved to Ghana, um, he when he joined the party, uh, he sent his telegram to Esther and Jack for them to release to the public. So that relationship, I think, is very significant. They were both influential in shaping his political ideology, and he also provided the two of them with a lot of guidance and insight. Um, he was, of course, instrumental um, in facilitating the Foundation of Freedom Ways magazine, which uh, Esther worked on with Shirley Du Bois. And um, so I think that relationship is really important, and I think that relationship also is one that sheds a lot of light on the larger arc of the black freedom movement, and it complicates the, the narrative that we commonly understand um, as sort of the fight for civil rights in the United States.
Let's see if we can take just one more question. Bill Meyer, your mic is self-muted now. Oh, there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know what happened, but it finally made it. Oh, thank you for letting me ask a question. Uh, actually, um, I enjoyed this. My first webinar, and I had to step away for half of it, so I'm very apologized. But I don't have half the report, but uh, I will certainly research. I'll watch the video later. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to ask our author uh, how much background you personally have in the studies of Marx and Lenin and communist uh, literature yourself. My own personal background. Um, because that influences the person's writing. I'm sorry? Because that has a great emphasis on the person's writing. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I've, most of my reading and experience came through doing the research throughout my late undergraduate career and um, in through, and into and throughout graduate school and in the writing of the book. Um, and my, uh, I think, exposure and experience with the Jacksons themselves um, on a personal basis also kind of facilitated that. Um, I would not consider myself, I would consider myself to be a historian of, um, you know, black radicalism and the black freedom movement. Um, and I think my expertise on Marxism and those readings comes from doing that work. Um, yeah. Okay, Tony, do you have any final words? Well, I would like to again thank uh, Sarah for agreeing to be a part of this really great webinar. I know that I learned uh, quite a bit, um, and I also want to encourage everybody uh, who's who's able to go out and uh, pick up uh, James and Esther Cooper Jackson Love and Courage in the Black Freedom Movement if I'm not mistaken it's uh, published by the uh, University of Kentucky Press um, and it's, it'll be it's, paperback in the winter so you keep an eye out for that too wonderful wonderful um, and so uh, please please do pick up a copy and uh, learn more about the uh, lives of James and Esther Cooper Jackson and uh, how their lives were situated front and center within the long civil rights uh, revolution. Um, I think that would be my final, my, my final, my closing remarks. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, we are going to, uh, I see someone who's flashing there. <laughs> Raised hand icon. Let's see what they. Uh... Okay, Craig, your mic is open. Thank you, and thank you, Professor Havel. And sorry, I thought I had my hand up, but I didn't. I'll be real quick. Um, both Jack and Esther Jackson were, um, you know, brilliant journalists as well as um, as, as well as activists for the uh, African American Freedom Movement. And I guess my question is, they were such a unified front. Um, in the beginning of their career, and until until Jack um, actually came out from being underground, um, and I wonder if you could just shed light in your research on, you know, being such brilliant theoreticians, activists, as well as journalists. Did you find anything exciting about where they were in theoretical conflict with each other about Marxism-Leninism, about the struggle, about where where did the split really happen? Was Sarah covering for Jack while he was underground, or was she always a committed communist and Marxist-Leninist, or you know, where was there ever a split? You know, I I I don't think that um, a distinct split comes up in the documents in a very clear and specific way anywhere. Um, but I do think that um, that the way Esther joined the party was very different from how Jack did. Um, Esther joined, she was um, at, um, at Fisk University um, in a graduate program in sociology and she was under the, she was like, she was in this sort of group of intellectuals um, and professors 
and she would go and have Marxist study groups and read their works and read theoretical tracts. And at one point, um, she recalled that they offered her um, just a, a way to sign up to be a member of the party, and she did. Um, and she didn't tell anybody for a while that she had actually joined the Communist Party, um, in part because she didn't necessarily see it as a huge deal, um, or as this, um, as as the kind of I think political commitment and. Um, uh, she didn't see it as the kind of political commitment that Jack did when he joined. Jack joined as a result of um, sort of coming out of an experience of sort of deep-seated racism in Richmond that um, ultimately he ends up joining as a way to affirm that there's um, a possibility of um, having interactions with white people that's not necessarily oppressive and not chauvinistic. Um, and his commitment to the party is rooted um, in this idea that it's a solution to the particular problems that he's experienced in a different way than Esther's joining of the Communist Party was. Um, and I think the split that happens in the 1950s uh, when she distances herself. She doesn't actually ever formally leave the party, but she stops going to formal party events. She stops participating in formal party activism. Um, and like I said before, I think that that happens in part as a result of the trauma she experienced over the course of his absence in the 1950s when he was underground, um, and in part as um, a reaction to the news that's coming out of the Soviet Union. Um, about Stalin and about war crimes and so on. Um, so what she ends up doing is she she doesn't she doesn't participate formally in party functions after that point. Um, when he returns, though, um, they have a really complicated period. They consider ending their marriage. Um, and they consider trying I mean, what she finds is that she's been running a household for nearly five years as the sole adult and accommodating and navigating around and understanding the quirks of another individual who's also trying to raise the children um, is a real struggle for her. Um, she's used to being very independent at that point. And he's trying to put himself right back into his family life. At the same time, he's experienced enormous trauma from being underground and fighting for his freedom and arguing before the courts about his right to his political expression and his political ideals. Um, and in that moment, he recommits to the party in a lot of ways and really reifies his um, investment in it as an organization and as a way to understand the problems in the world and a way to solve them. Um, so I think that's the moment where they have this split, but it's happening at this point where they're also go, going through all of these other personal transformations. Um, so I don't think you can necessarily pick those apart and say that there is a political separation that's um, distinct and separate from all of the other traumas and trials that are happening in their lives at that point. Um, one of the things that I did find throughout my research is that even as she's distanced herself from the organization, he comes to her defense before them quite a bit. Um, and he often talks about how their marriage is really important and he still considers her half of an all-party couple. He says that in 1977 when he's giving a talk on the uh, woman question before a group of, I think it's college students. Um, and he considers her half of this all-party family, um, and he argues that, you know, they both had this agreement that they would choose their political ideals over one another if it came to that. Um, and so you see this real genuine support for one another, even in moments where they're somewhat politically divided, and I think, um, you know, I think part of that is just the complexity of a marriage that lasts multiple decades um, and, you know, a lifetime, really. And part of it is the, the, um, the difficulties that um, 
politics and diplomacy and the deeper um, sort of social and political backdrop of a moment impose upon people as they try and navigate all of that together. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's so wonderful to learn that uh, through uh, Freedom Ways, Esther uh, uh, helped uh, to uh, push forward uh, Alice Walker, Audre Lorde, and, and others. Thank We're you. proud of that. Yes. And so uh, we thank you, everyone, for participating tonight, and we wish you good night. Thank, Thank you, you, Tony. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you.